Well, good morning, everybody. It is great to have you here. Welcome to Portico. If you're watching online today, welcome to you as well. And Pastor Dwayne, welcome to the stage. Thank you. It's always a privilege to be here with you, to be here in front of you guys. And uh, people online, hello. So, we're, you know, we're in the series, and we're talking about Jesus. We're looking at the Gospel of John. So Pastor Rick has been, you know, sort of delegating who's going to speak when and what we're going to cover and, you know, the material that we're going to share together. And as we wrap up the series, we had one that was called Jesus in the Future, and I noticed that he opted out. Yes. So Wise man. I, he is. So Dwayne... Tell us about the future. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> We're going to have an interesting morning, so we want you to get your Bibles out, get your apps out, your Portico app, and you can follow along. You know, I was thinking about it. We were talking a little bit, and uh, we were thinking about the future and some of the conversation that we're about to have. We're going to make it intensely practical because we're going to have a look at this. But I, I got thinking about this. You know, as we, well, I'm, I'm going to say for me, but I think a lot of us would fit into this category. So when I started off, you know, early in my career, and I think about the future, I'm, all, I'm not thinking about, you know, God's future. I was thinking about my future, and yeah. it was fairly easy to dismiss it. It was too far away. Do you remember when you were like in your mid-20s, and you saw somebody that was like 39, you go, wow, they're old. <laughs> remember that? You go, I got lots of time. So you kind of dismiss it. You go, you know, someday I'll think about it. And then you turn 40, and you go, wow. What would Freedom 55 be like? What would Freedom 59? I think we're up to about Freedom 89 now, but what would that look like? And you start, so you dream about it, and you start thinking about the future with a little more dream. And then you get closer to, well, I'll say my age. I'll give you a little room. Sure. You get closer to my age, and you start to dread it. Will I have enough money? Will, will I be healthy enough? Will I live long enough? Will I live too long? All the things that go through our minds. So, you know, the future is very relevant when we think about our lives. Yeah, and I think, you know, we have always been... Listen, if you're not afraid of the future, and I hope that you're not, you are enamored with the future. Um, that's why sci-fi or science fiction, that genre, it's pretty popular. This is why, to be honest, people go to uh, get their palms read. They read horoscopes. Um, this is why people do different things like that. People are caught up with technology. Yeah. How can we advance? How can we get further? I even had somebody, a friend of mine, um, when everything was happening in uh, the Ukraine, they were concerned about the future. And this isn't the first time they've done this. They asked me, is there anything in the Bible that mentions these future events? And I said to them, you know what? It doesn't mention everything, but one thing I do know, Jesus said, keep your eyes on him and everything will be okay. So whatever the future brings, we know at the end of the day that God wins, Jesus wins, the church wins, so on and so forth. But we're to keep our eyes on him regardless of what we think is going to come. You know, there's a, there's a dynamic tension in that, isn't there? Because uh, you sit and listen to us and you may be watching us today and I talk about this and you go, yeah, but the intense practical reality, we got wars and we got rumors of wars and we got things that are unsaid. We just came through two years of COVID. It's amazing how quickly our future condenses and shrinks down to our immediate reality and we go, this is what I'm living in the middle of. Yeah. So we thought it'd be interesting to go out to social media because Jesus had a lot to say about the future. He taught a lot about the future. So we went to social media and we had some interesting questions. So maybe share the question that we threw out there. And some of you responded. We had some fascinating responses. So is it better to live for the present or for the future? That was the question. Here's some of the answers. Uh, first answer, live life day by day so God can take care of your future. That's pretty good. I like that philosophy. That's solid. Yeah. Next one. Uh, Future is mainly the goal. I think that's what they're trying to say. But also, we need to enjoy the present journey. That's important as well. And the last response is, is it, it is better to live in the present moment because the future is not guaranteed. That is very interesting. That is a really interesting statement. Yeah. In fact, you know, uh, when I was thinking about this, there's a very, very common idiom. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may... Oh, you all know that. <laughs> 
Isn't that fascinating? And everybody goes, who, who stated that? Where did that come from? And in fact, if you do some research on this, what you'll find is people will often source it back to the Bible to say, well, that's a biblical quote. That's a good one. Eat, drink, and be married, for tomorrow you're going to die. Actually, it's an amalgamation of some of the quotes. So before you go and tattoo your body with eat, drink, and be married, for tomorrow we're going to die, you should know that it comes out of Solomon's sort of reflections when he was in a period of time wrestling through what is life, what is meaning, what is purpose, and then he throws this out there. So the Bible actually doesn't endorse an eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you're going to die attitude. In fact, it goes the other way. It says you need to be very sober-minded and think very diligently about your future yeah. because God does care about our future and it's important how we live that out. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, we are going to go to our key text today. It is John chapter 14 verses 1 to 6. And if you have your Bible, if you could open it there, we're going to be reading from the New Living Translation whenever you hear us quoting the verses. If you have your Portico app, you can go there. We've set it up for you, and you could uh, just follow along with us. And the first point that we want to address this morning, when we look at Jesus in the future, is that Jesus meets us at our point of need. Jesus meets us at our point of need. So follow along with me, verse 1 of John chapter 14. Jesus said this to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, also believe in me. Now, when we're reading that, we're jumping right into the middle of the story. Yeah. But I want you to understand what's going on a little bit. What's happening is that Jesus has washed the disciples' feet, and he's told them that he's going to be betrayed. So when they're hearing this, they're upset as you and I could imagine, right? So when he comes and he says these words, he's saying to his disciples, in their moment of need, I understand you and I discern what you're walking through. And when I think about this, I think of empathy. I think about how empathy, Jesus had empathy with his followers and it took him from a place of simply feeling bad for them to a place of, look, I know what you're walking through. And I'm saying these words to you so that you will not grow faint or you won't get weary. And I think today when we think about the future, like some people, they get really scared. They get really apprehensive. They look at the times that we're in and they say, oh my goodness, what's going on? Jesus would say these same words to us today. He would say to us, don't let our hearts be troubled. Believe in God and also believe in him. You know, when I was thinking about the whole thing of empathy and sympathy and mm -hmm. pity, I thought that, listen, if we have sympathy and pity, we feel bad for someone. That's all well and good. But when you empathize, you put yourself in that person's shoes. And in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, it's really interesting what Jesus does. Here's the word says this, Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. So it's very interesting. If I empathize with you, I would put myself in your place, and I would take whatever's coming your way. Right. Jesus goes a step further. He says, I will not only put myself in your place, and that's eventually what he did when he went on the cross. I want you to take my place. I want you to take my yoke. I want you to take my burden. And he says, the good news is my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isn't it wonderful to know that Jesus is inviting you to something that is easy and light? I think that's encouraging. I think that's a blessing. So when Jesus is saying these words to his, to his followers, I think he's speaking to us as well to say, look, don't be weighed down by what's happening presently. And don't be scared of the future because God has something great in store for those who follow him. So let me pick up on where you're coming from. And you picked up one of these little cups on the way in this morning. And if you're online at home, we're going to do communion at the end of our service and probably didn't give a lot of thought to it. You just picked it up, came into the room, sat down, and you're preparing to join us when we do communion together. But let's go back to the text that you read in John 14. And the text in John 14 is Jesus sharing this Last Supper, which was the Passover meal with his disciples. What's fascinating about it is 
Jesus could have gone to Bethany, a very intimate gathering. He could have gone and been with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, just raised him from the dead. Why not hang out with a really good friend that is very close to you? Could have dismissed his disciples and said, look, this is a pilgrimage feast. Your family's going to be in Jerusalem. They're going to be here. But he chooses not to. He said, I want to do this with you. So he makes arrangements for a Passover meal, and Peter and John go out, and they get all the details covered off, and then Jesus gathers together. And then in this upper room gathering, I want you to listen to these words again, because Jesus chose to bring his disciples there. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And they would have wondered, what are you talking about? Like, Jesus, we've, we've got the tide of popular opinion driving us forward. People are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What are you talking about trouble? There's no trouble here. Things are going in our direction, the kingdom, the way you're talking about it. We've got the favor of the people. But Jesus knew something, that at just the turn of a couple of hours, their world would be flipped upside down. And the experience of trouble would suddenly become very personal and very real. See, we need to be reminded so often our point of need changes in mere hours. We can be very objective about what it means to meet us at our point of need, but suddenly within hours it can become deeply subjective and very, very personal. Nobody really paid attention to the fact that as they ate that meal, Judas slipped out. Mm. Jesus turned and said to them, what you have to do, go and do it quickly. Nobody questioned. In fact, they thought, well, maybe he's the treasurer. He's going out to buy some more supplies. But he was already following through on a very devious, wicked plan that would betray Jesus. None of them could have imagined that this band of brothers would be stretched to the point of breaking and that suddenly they would be scattered and sent away. And so as you listen to the words that we're sharing, that we're teaching together, you begin to realize that meeting us at our point of need for Jesus was very, very important for them. He needed his disciples to know, you're about to face something, and it's going to rock your worlds. And friends, here's what's so strong for us. God understands us, Mm -hmm. and Jesus meets us at the place where we are most desperate in those moments. It was actually Jesus when he was on the cross that looked down and he saw his disciple John and he saw his mother and he said these words and he said, dear woman, here is your son. And then he said to John, here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Even in the moment of his death, Mm -hmm. Jesus is meeting other people at their point of need. Such a powerful reminder for us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with that, we're going to go to point number two. Jesus shifts our perspective from the dirt to the divine, and we're going to explain what we mean by that point. So when we think about Jesus' approach to the future, we recognize that he wanted to get his disciples' focus off of what they could see, which was the present trouble, as opposed to what they couldn't see yet, which was the future glory. Now in John chapter 14, verses 2 to 3, Jesus says these words, My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, and you also, that you may also be where I am. Isn't that a marvelous promise? I think that's absolutely fantastic. You know, he went on to say in John chapter 16, verse 33, and I'll read this as well. I have told you all this, so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So when we were coming up with this point in uh, our pastor's uh, gathering as we study for these, and we came up with the whole idea of the dirt and the divine, I thought about it. And I thought about those words that Jesus said, here on earth, here on earth, we will have problems. We understand that in the Bible, the earth that Jesus is talking about, there is the world. We understand that. But I began to continue to think about that that whole idea of earth and, and the dirt and the divine. You know, when you think about the earth, when you think about earth, you think about the soil, you think about, um, you know, as I said, you think about dirt. You think about that dirt is a ground or a breeding ground for growth. Dirt is a breeding ground for growth. 
Earth is a breeding ground for earth. Our time on earth is a breeding ground for growth. What we're walking through presently is for us to develop, to mature. But what we're walking through presently isn't everything that there is to our life. And this is what Jesus is trying to say. Don't get caught up in this life so much that you miss what's to come. Don't get caught up in the trouble. Don't get caught up in all of the spectacular things that are happening around you. Don't get so focused on how you're living right now that you miss what I want to do in the future. You know, there was another time that Jesus was talking, and this will not come up on the screen, but Jesus actually, he identified the grief that his disciples were walking through, and in John chapter 16, verse 6 to 7, he said, I know you're sad, I know you're grieving, but I've got a future promise for you, and the future promise he was talking about at that time was the Holy Spirit to come. Right. God always has something for us, ladies and gentlemen. This life that we're walking through and however you walked into this room, it's not everything that there is. There's something glorious that God wants to do in our lives, and it's the future and his plans. So you know when you're talking about shifting our focus from the dirt to the divine, if you're new to the Bible, this might help you contextually frame this. When you read and you get into John and you start to read John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16, you realize that here we are in the upper room. Jesus, and then John 17, he prays. This is all together in this upper room in a very intimate gathering. And so this is Jesus having a very close, intimate conversation. And Dwayne, I started to think about that verse you read. And if your Bibles are still open, I want you to look at verse uh, 2 again, John 14, verse 2. It says, My Father's house has many rooms. And if it were not so, I would have told you, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come back and take you to be with me. Now just stop for a moment and think about their world. Everything had been, the kingdom is here, the kingdom is now, the kingdom is at hand. God's purpose is prevailing. Repent and turn. All that they knew had been about the promise and expectation that what God was doing was now, it was immediate, it was tangible, mm -hmm. it was visible. There were miracles, there were healings, there were resurrections from the dead. They're, they were blown away by what Jesus was doing. People were marveling at his teaching. This is a man who has authority. This has to be the Messiah. So you move that energy and emotion, and if you were a follower of Jesus, if you were one of the disciples of Jesus, you would have gone, finally, everything that the Torah has been teaching us and everything that I've been hoping for, my hope in the future has now been realized. The future has now come, and the future is here. And then Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place. And you go, what are you doing? Why are you moving now to the future? And what do you mean you're going to come back and take us to be with you where you are? You see, that's this tension, this dynamic tension that comes with God's kingdom. It is now and yet not already. Like it's this mixture. It's already here and yet more is to come. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus was preparing them that there's so much more to this than what their minds had wrapped around. And so often what we do is we feel like we really understand what God's purposes are. And then we just cement it right now. And Jesus said, no, you've got to keep the future in the way that you think. I wrote it down this way. I think we often seriously underestimate our tendency to live without factoring eternity into the equation. We give mental assent mm -hmm. to the future, but I don't know that we often live with the awareness and the understanding. That's why our values and our morals and our ideals and our worldview are so radically different. When people look at us, and if you're a follower of Christ, they try to understand, what, what is it about you? Because you live with generosity. You love unconditionally. You expect something greater, and there's a hope that's tangible for you. And that's what Jesus was instilling in them, is that the here and now is not the fullness of the kingdom. There is yet the coming, the consummation, and the expectation of what God is going to do. It's these two worldviews that we will constantly wrestle with. I think of Peter, and I shared this with you when we were thinking about today. And do you remember Peter, if you're familiar with the Scripture, there was this time he was crossing with the disciples in the boat, and Jesus fell asleep, and a storm came up. Remember that? And I mean, it was just ripping the sails off of that boat, and it was rocking them to the point that they thought they were going to die. 
And they wake Jesus up, and of course Peter's panicked, don't you care if we're going to die? And he was almost rebuking Jesus in that moment because he was living in the now, and he hadn't been able to frame his understanding of what the future looked like. In a storm, in trouble, in challenge, our worlds are immediately immersed into turmoil and chaos, and we just can't see God's purpose in that. And Jesus gets up and rebukes the wind and the wave, and if you read the rest of the story, it says they were amazed. They go, what kind of man is this? Who is this? Mm -hmm. Then you fast forward, post-resurrection. Jesus has ascended into heaven. Peter's already preached out in front of the crowds. People are coming into the kingdom. And Herod realized that if he takes some of the disciples captive and has them killed, it pleases the people. So he imprisons Peter. And now Peter's in prison. One of his peers has already died, been executed. And he's sitting between guards waiting for the day of his execution. A fascinating part of that, if you read Acts chapter 12, you read the story, and how do we find Peter? Fast asleep. Laid his head down, said it's okay, because my future is both now and yet to come. And he wasn't worried, he wasn't striving, he wasn't struggling for his life. And while the church prayed and interceded, beautiful miracle for Peter to be released. But I wonder how often we live so much in the now that God's future actually doesn't come in and inform how we emotionally respond to our now. And there's a lesson from Peter here that God shifts our focus, Jesus shifts our focus from dirt to divine when we realize that God cares and God has all things in control. Psalm 91, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. That when you walk with God, What affects us now is real, it's personal, it's deep, it could be painful, it could be chaotic. But it doesn't change the trajectory of our life when we trust in Christ. Because Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many rooms. And by the way, when I get my room, I'm going to put a do not disturb sign up there on the door, all right? (laughs) Love being your pastor, but I'm going to take a little time off when we get there. Now clean that up and give us point three. (laughs) Jesus shows us the way to heaven. That's the third point and our final point. John chapter 14, verses 4 to 6 says, You know the way to where I am going. But Thomas said, No, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. What a powerful statement that Jesus made. So, so if you want to put this in uh, sports terms, this is like the coach in the fourth quarter talking to his team, rallying them, and saying, come on, guys, we're almost at the end of the game. We've got to come through. You see, when Jesus died, their world would turn upside down. So these words were meant for them to remember and to carry them through. But Jesus is saying that he's been with them for this long and they need to be resolute in their belief. And I think Jesus is saying the same thing to us today. Yeah. When they gathered in that upper room, I think that's a a rather fitting analogy, the way to look at that night. Jesus gathers them around the table and it would have been a beautiful, I mean, I would have loved to have been in the environment just to watch and observe because the intimacy and the tenderness with which Jesus spoke to his disciples, these are the people that he shared his life with. He called them. They were his chosen ones. He knew one was going to betray him, and that was a pain that he would bear, and later in the garden he would pray through that. But before he ends the night, he would pray over these men. He would pray over their families. He would pray over his church. He'd pray over us. That beautiful prayer in John 17 But something remarkable took place. See, they didn't gather for a communion service. They didn't gather with a little cup and a wafer and, you know, that we're going to share together. This was Passover. They gathered for Passover to look back and look at what God had done and look at how God had protected and provided. And then Jesus did something. He took common elements. He took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. And you could almost imagine all of them looking around the table and going, no, it, 
it's a, we, we sacrificed the lamb for tonight. We're, we're sharing a lamb, but Jesus didn't lose eye contact. This is my body, which is broken for you. And I want you to eat this. And a little bit later, he took a second cup. He said, this cup is my blood. It is the covenant. It is a new covenant. And I will not do this again until we drink it together in the kingdom. And Jesus took now and tied it to the future and made it inseparable. And he said, and I'm going to do it with you. Whenever you do this, you're going to do this in remembrance of me. Friends, from the very open pages of Scripture, in the beginning, God, right up through John chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. God's purpose and plan has always prevailed. And the future is not in my hands, not in your hands, not in your hands. The future is in God's hands. So we live fully today because of who Christ is to us. So we want to celebrate that together. And we know, we know that as we gather, some of us are going through some very, very challenging times. We just prayed for the Ukraine. We prayed for people that are displaced, millions of children that we now have to facilitate and help them find new ways to live and thrive and find new homes. You're maybe looking for a job. You maybe got a report from a doctor this week that's just sort of, again, unsettled your world. Or maybe the fight that you had on the way to the church, it's taken everything to keep the tears from flowing. And you wonder, God, do you see the pain in my marriage? Do you see the pain in my family? He does. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Beautiful reminder for us. So Dwayne, lead us into communion. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't already done so, I want to invite you to take the symbol of the broken body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what we're going to do with that symbol before we partake is we're just going to break it. We're just going to snap it. Just a reminder of how he was broken for us. And I want to pray before we partake, and then we'll take the symbol. Lord Jesus, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. But God, what we are doing presently is wrapped in our hope for the future. God, we realize that you sent your son to be broken for us so that we could be whole. And Lord, as we do this presently, we, we give you praise for that wholeness. But Lord, we also look forward to the future where we will share that marriage supper of the Lamb that it talks about in Revelation, where we will share this in celebration of what you've done in our lives. We give you honor and we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace and mercy in this act. In Jesus' name. Let's partake. So then Jesus took the cup. And visual imagery is powerful in Scripture. And they would have remembered the blood over the lentil, over the doorpost. But he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood shed for you. And all of them around the room would have this new moment of awareness. They wouldn't perceive the fullness of it, but Jesus was instituting something new. Friends, it was the beginning of a new covenant. And by laying his life down, he was saying, but through my blood, salvation, the payment for sin, the redemption, everything the creation has been longing for is being fulfilled in this moment. And there are no outsiders. There are just those that choose to trust in Jesus. And that's why we gather together to do this. And we are reminded when we hold this cup, by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are made whole. We have physical healing, emotional healing. We have relational healing. It's all there. But friends, it all comes under the blood, doesn't it? 
So let's receive the cup together. Let me just pray for you this morning. Father, this morning I take a moment just to offer this prayer. As we receive the cup, symbolic of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, I pray for every one of us that, Lord, in our moments of life, that we wouldn't get caught so carefully in the details of our individual lives that we would forget to lift our eyes towards heaven and recognize that you are the author and the perfecter of our salvation, that our lives are fully in your hands. And that as we receive communion today, we are reminded one more time that Jesus, you lived, you died, you paid the price for our sins, and by the power of God, you were raised back to life. And through that resurrection power, you gave victory over sin and death and darkness. So today, no matter what we're facing, what we're going through, highly individual in terms of the story and how it applies to our own lives, but collectively together, we stand before you and Holy Spirit, we pray, make it so real. Bring freedom and hope and life and change and transformation as you can do into our lives. And may we live with the hope and the assurance that Father, your kingdom is now here and is yet to be fully realized. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name.